So, we took a survey of a few Irvington students. To describe what exactly Irvington seems like to you. Words that kept popping up were hardworking, smart, nerdy, geeky, and overwhelmingly Asian. Not surprisingly enough, this very picture of a nerdy, hardworking, yet geeky Asian is what has been known to many Americans as the myth of the Asian model minority. If you take the slide, please. So what exactly is a model minority? Well, a model minority is a group of people who are held to be more successful than the average population. Success as measured by things like wealth or education attainment. What we really see is by lumping all Asians together towards one model minority, every single Asian ethnicity, be it Chinese, Filipino, Korean, or Vietnamese, and many more, are lumped towards one single identity. So what are some Asian stereotypes that come with the model minority? We all probably know the first few ones. Asians are smart and good at math, probably don't have a hard time in Lunar Chung. But furthermore, Asians also tend to be seen as more wealthy, better off in terms of their income. Asians are also seen as those who are hardworking and self-reliant and get what they are by pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. But some negative stereotypes include this idea that Asians are docile and submissive, don't dare to speak up for themselves or shake the boat. Furthermore, Asians can also be seen as more spiritually enlightened, particularly in terms of commercial exploitation. But also, overwhelmingly, Asians are seen as not in need of aid, be it political or economic. So once again, a recurring theme that we see. So by identifying Asians by these characteristics, we wipe away the things that make different Asians different, and instead lumped in once again towards one singular category. So before we determine whether or not the myth of the model minority is good or bad, we have to evaluate whether or not it's true, and if so, to what extent. Obviously, there's a myriad of ways to measure what success is, but in the context of the model minority stereotype, it's generally categorized into education, wealth, and income. So we'll be examining those today. Next slide, please. So if we evaluate education, we can see that holistically speaking, it appears that Asian Americans are more well-educated than their non-Asian American peers. Asian Americans have the highest attainment of college education. 49% of Asians have a bachelor's degree, whereas only 31% of whites, 18% of blacks, and 13% of Latino Americans have the same level of education. Furthermore, 21% more of Asian Americans have a postgraduate degree, like a master's or a PhD, which is higher than any other ethnic group by far. Furthermore, if we examine the UC system, over 40% of its students are of Asian descent whereas less than 20% of the Californian population is Asian. Examining the elite Ivy League institutions, over 18% of the student body in most of those co colleges are Asian American. However, in the United States, less than 5% of the population is Asian. Furthermore, evaluating high school graduation rates, we can see that Asian Americans, even there, have some of the highest graduation rates if we view them as an ethnic whole. So if we look at education, it appears that Asian Americans are overwhelmingly more successful than non-Asian American counterparts. Next slide, please. Next, examining income and wealth, the same holds true. Asian Americans have the highest median income at approximately $66,000 for a family of four, whereas the, uh, the median income for a white family is around, a family of four would be around $55,000, and for the, oh, a family of, average family of four in all of America would be around $49,000. Asian Americans also accumulate wealth at faster and larger rates, and they have some of the highest net median wealth of any, uh, of any other ethnic group. Next slide, please. So we have to ask ourselves, why do Asians do so well? And there's several different potential reasons. First is that there's a highly educated immigrant population. Many of the immigrants who actually, many Asian immigrants who came to the United States either came on student visas or on H-1B-1 visas, which are essentially visas for them to perform high, high skill, like high paying economic jobs. And so what we see is that when you have this large influx of immigrants who are well educated, chances are they're going to do pretty well and their children are going to do pretty well. However, this isn't representative of all Asians. For example, 51% of Chinese immigrants to the United States have a college degree of some sort. However, if you look at mainland China, less than 4% of all adults have a college degree. Furthermore, there's this idea that there's a cultural emphasis on education. And what I mean by this is that among Asians specifically, although all ethnic groups like, emphasize that education is important, Asian Americans overwhelmingly link education with work ethic rather than with inherent skill or intelligence. What this means is that your average Asian parent is more likely to 
push their child because they believe that hard work is a solution, whereas your non-Asian parent may not do so and may like believe more intelligence has something to do with it. Another reason could be the low divorce rates. If you look at this chart, you can clearly see that Asian Americans, even regardless of your ethnic group, actually have some of the lowest divorce rates. Bangladeshi Americans, for example, have only about four divorces for every thousand married couples, and the trend holds true for multiple different ethnic groups. Now, the reason that this is a big deal is because when there is a divorce, the assets, the wealth, and the income of a household get split in two. I mean, the child is less likely to have the same educational opportunities. The child is more likely to go into poverty if, if, he, if the child is living with one of the parents. And thus, the child is less likely to have as much educational and eventually economic success. So when you have these lower divorce rates, which are seen in Asian American households, the child is, again, more likely to do well in school. And lastly, there's the idea of the Pygmalion effect. The Pygmalion effect essentially says that teachers in schools believe that their Asian students will do well, simply because of the stereotypes that exist. Because they believe the Asian students will do well, the teachers will focus a lot of their intention on those Asian students, which in turn creates a self-fulfilling prophecy, where the Asian students do well because of the increase in attention. Next slide, please. So again, we have to ask ourselves, is the model minority of stereotype true? stereotype true? Is it actually accurate? And Michelle and I are still going to answer with a resounding no, for several different reasons. First, if we examine the income and wealth statistics, we can see that they're extremely misleading for several different reasons. First is that Asians generally tend, Asian Americans generally tend to live in areas with high costs of living. For example, the San Francisco Bay Area, like you guys know, is very, very expensive, and it has a lot of Asians. So employers in this region generally have to pay their employees more to, like, to offset the cost of living. So even though someone in San Francisco might make $70,000, they could have the same standard of living of, say, someone in Rochester, New York, who only makes $50,000 simply because of the difference in cost of living. The next reason that the model minority stereotype isn't accurate is because all Asians are clumped into one group. According to the government, Michelle and I are both Asian American, but as you can see, we are not closely related at all. We are completely different ethnicities. And this is really, really important because even though Asians holistically appear to be very successful, it varies drastically from ethnic group to ethnic group. Some ethnic groups can perform very well in education and economic statistics, whereas some ethnic groups, which are still Asian, do not perform as well. And one of the key, like one of the key points of differentiation is whether or not a particular ethnic group came mainly as economic immigrants or student immigrants, or whether they came as refugees. Next slide, please. And so particular Asian groups in America, such as Cambodian, Laotian, Hmong, Vietnamese, Iraqi, and Afghani Americans, came to the United States primarily as refugees specifically political refugees, either after a war or after some war or, or after a conflict. And the reason that this is a big deal is because they didn't come with the same amount of wealth or the same education as many other economic immigrants came with, meaning they literally had to start with nothing and they had to start in poverty and bake their way up. And the reason that this is a really big deal is because then it's harder for them to attain the same level of success. So if you if I look at this chart over here, you can see that although many different Asian groups have higher rates of graduation in both college and high school, there's also many different Asian ethnicities that don't have the same levels of success. So what this tells you is that the success that all Asians are purported to have is not very even. It's pretty lopsided. Furthermore, Asian Americans, specifically Cambodian, Laotian, and Hmong Americans, have extremely high poverty rates. Cambodian Americans, for example, have poverty rates around 39%. Laotian Americans have poverty rates at about 29%, significantly higher than the average poverty rate for all of America at about 12 to 13%. And what's even worse about this poverty is that it's systemic. What this means is that it'll last from one to two, more than one generation, it'll last for two to three generations. So a Laotian, Amer a Laotian American who's born today in poverty can expect his or her grandchild to also be in poverty 60 years later. And also, when we look at these groups that specifically came as refugees, we can see that they have very low English proficiency, especially compared to many other ethnic groups. 44% of Asian Americans in California claim that they struggle with English. But if you believe that the model minority stereotype, it might not, you might not actually believe that statistic. Next slide, please. So it might seem like being called a model minority really isn't that bad of a deal. I mean, when you're hailed as pretty much being so-called the perfect model of what a race should aspire to, then really, what problems could you have? The reality, though, is that the model minority myth has deeply insidious effects, firstly, on the Asian American community itself. The first way that we see this is through the very, very low rates of political participation that most Asians engage in. In fact, the Asian American turnout rate stands at only 65% as compared to a national
No, Adrian, 73%. Well, that essentially means because the Asian model minority itself inherently dictates that Asians, as they pertain to this minority, must be quiet and obedient and not make waves on a political stage, the needs of the Asian community and the very diverse group within what exactly constitutes an Asian are ignored and overlooked by policymakers and the government alike. And we see the harm to that in three ways. Firstly, looking towards education. Back in 2014, an elementary and secondary education act was passed by Congress. What the act was supposed to do was collect education data from different students based on their ethnicity to see what races were underperforming and therefore needed more financial aid and more resources. But that bill had one glaring defect. It had one single category for all Asian Americans that simply lumped under Asian. And as we know, that's not, that's not exactly how it works. When an amendment was tried to be passed to change that bill, to make so that different Asian groups would have their data collected separately, that amendment was struck down. And we see those Asians like Loatian and Vietnamese, for example, who tend to come from more socioeconomic backgrounds and are more disadvantaged, have their needs ignored. They go on in life to have lower standards of living overall, because when their economic and education situation could have been fixed by the law, the law instead chose to ignore them. But secondly, we also see problems when it comes towards poverty. As Aditya recently pointed out, Malaysian and Cambodian Americans have among the highest rates of poverty among the entire nation. So when you look towards census data, it only reveals Asian income rates under the single category of Asian. So those who tend to do better, like for example, Indian Americans have their higher incomes offset the lower incomes of those who are doing worse. And the overall problem isn't shown by the numbers. When lawmakers don't see the problems, they don't solve it. So poverty continues unabated for a vast minority of those suffering in silence. But lastly, we also see a problem of trauma. Because so many Asian immigrants come here fleeing persecution, be it political, religious, or otherwise, so those such as Afghan Americans, for example, report higher rates of PTSD that then goes unaddressed by the government. Because once again, this idea of an Asian model minority doesn't leave room for that. But secondly, because the other Asian groups' different experiences eclipse those of a specific group. We also see a lack of academic research. When we were researching for this TED Talk, it was really, really hard to find studies that show the exact extent to which Asians are affected by the model minority myth mostly because no one has dared to or even thought of putting such studies up. Because insofar as people internalize this idea of an Asian model minority, they don't see different Asian communities as having distinct experiences and distinct narratives and distinct problems. So, so those studies that do tend to address Asian issues address Asians as one collective whole. And overall, the Asian model minority myth affects all of us on a day-to-day -day basis. Because discrimination does still exist for Asian Americans, for example, a discrimination in hiring practices. The Asian modern, modern minority myth eclipses that, hides that, and masks that. And so this everyday problem that many Asians face is just left ignored completely. Next slide, please. But of course, taking a step back towards the bigger picture, what we realize is that the Asian model minority myth isn't just one isolated occurrence, and it was never meant to be. See, back in 1966, during the height of the United States' civil rights movement, New York Times published one article that has since then made history. It was titled, Japanese American Success Story. That article detailed how Japanese Americans overcame every single possible barrier to achieve what was so-called the American dream. And numerous studies and government reports following that have only gone on to further perpetuate this idea of an Asian model minority. But that has had deeply insidious effects. We first see that through how the Asian community itself has often internalized racism. Because when you're constantly fed this narrative that your culture is better and your culture is somehow innately more hardworking and therefore superior, it's not hard to see why a lot of Asians do hold racist views. This racism only goes further towards perpetuating divides between different races in America and preventing us from truly coming together to find solutions to racial progress and racial equality. But secondly, the modern minority myth was also from the very beginning designed to divide minorities, creating a me-you relationship, in which Asians are put upon one single pedestal and isolated. Other races are simply viewed as the other. The reality is that Asian Americans share a lot in common with other races. Looking, for example, towards the Chinese Exclusion Act, Chinese Americans have for a very long time been discriminated against by American society itself. 
that history is largely erased. Even more, you probably haven't heard of Yuri Kirchiyama. She was a prominent activist during the civil rights movement, and she worked very closely with Malcolm X to advance a vision of racial progress. But these stories of racism against Asians, these shared narratives of rooting discrimination are erased by the idea of an Asian model minority. When that happens, we can't come together to bridge the gap and have meaningful conversations and therefore build a truly effective coalition to address racism today. Divided, we destroy ourselves and each other. But united, we can work towards a better America. And lastly, the Asian model minority myth has for a very long time been used as a tool of anti-blackness. Because how easy is it to point towards Asian Americans and say, if they could do it, why can't you? Well, the reality is that America today is far more complicated than that. That's been an effective tool to disguise and often even justify racism and say that it doesn't exist because the numbers show that it doesn't. But when the numbers actually do show that it does, even among Asians themselves. But furthermore, we, look, we can look towards one prominent example, which everyone probably knows, of how a vast majority of Asian Americans have been used as a poster child for the anti-affirmative action program. Now, a lot of Asians are opposed to affirmative action because they claim that it's reverse discrimination against Asians. But the reality is that this mindset, perpetuated by the Asian model minority, only serves to cast racial relations as a zero-sum game, in which if they win, then we must lose. Well, that's not true at all. Looking more, for example, towards college admissions, one problem that actually is very much a problem is that of legacy. We get in based on economic or social connections, but not a disadvantaged African American students who overcome backgrounds of oppression to get where they are in college. We don't have those conversations or those stories because of the model minority myth. So I know we've just bombarded you with like a lot of evidence and a lot of statistics, but the pervasive nature of the model minority myth even affects students here at Irvington High School. Because like Michelle already mentioned that even Asian students, which account for 60% of Irvington's student body, even Asian students will have this sort of idea of what a typical, perfect Asian student is supposed to be. And when we have this sort of manifestation, this sort of idea of what an Asian is supposed to be, not, gonna, not only can it like cause internal trouble because we feel, and inevitably we're gonna feel that we don't fit this stereotype, but also it can allow us to mask the problems of our friends and our peers. Like one of the previous speakers was talking about, depression is a pervasive issue that definitely affects many, many people here, not only in the audience, but also in our school. I myself was depressed for over a month at a time, but I felt that I couldn't talk about it simply because I didn't think that people around me, my parents would understand. And this sort of idea of the model minority myth does affect everyone, and it does affect students at Irving High School. So if you're just gonna have one message that we wanna leave you with this talk, it's the idea that look past the stereotypes, look past like all the things that are bombarded to you about what you're supposed to be, and just look at people like they're individual people. Thank you. <laughs>